Hello. Uh, as Marcel just uh, very kindly introduced me, I'm Alexandra Gunderson, and I'm a data scientist at a company called Arundo. So Arundo enables smarter operations by providing industrial analytics to asset-heavy industries. So that's industries like oil and gas, maritime, and utilities. We're based a little bit further up north in cold Oslo, Norway, but we come really often here to Switzerland because of our strong partnership with SIGPA. So if you're from the area, you've definitely heard of them. Uh, they deliver secure track and trace and authentication solutions across multiple value chains. They work in things such as fuel marking to securing banknotes. Recently, Arundo and SIGPA have sort of joined forces and combined our core competencies and working on really interesting problems where we ensure oil and gas supply chain integrity. I'm really excited to be here uh, at Applied Machine Learning Days representing both of these companies, and I'll just share uh, some of my experience working as a data scientist in the oil and gas industry. Um, it seems like every day there's more and more advanced algorithms that are available to us. Uh, they're available in the tools that we use, like Python and Scikit-learn. But in the world that I work in, building a cool and sexy algorithm isn't enough. There are barriers in place that make it really difficult to apply these algorithms. So we've heard about some of these barriers earlier today. Claudio talked about a lack of labeled data. Olga talked about trust in AI. And this is something that I see. And so I'm going to explain some of the challenges how we overcome them in this industry by sharing an example from a recent customer engagement. So up here on the screen, this is Björn. Björn is a rotating equipment specialist for the Norena platform off the west coast of Norway. He's heard of AI, but he doesn't really understand the role that it has on his rig. And he's also a little bit nervous that it's going to take his job. A typical day for Björn involves monitoring the tens of thousands of sensors that sit on the Nordina platform. So a sensor, that can be anything like a temperature sensor, a pressure sensor, a flow sensor. And each of these, thre uh, each of these sensors have thresholds. When they exceed the thresholds, they raise an alarm. So sometimes, if you think, for example, a temperature sensor, maybe its normal operating is between 30 and 40 Celsius, and the alarm limit is at 50 Celsius. So if it exceeds that threshold, it'll raise an alarm. It could be that it makes sense for the, current, uh, for the current operating mode. Maybe it's a temperature sensor on a motor. And it, it just that they've increased the motor speed, so the temperature is increasing. But regardless of if it makes sense or if it, is, uh, um, if it represents an impending failure, it's Bjorn's job to investigate the hundreds of alarms that are raised every day and make that decision. It's really important that he's thorough in this analysis, because on an oil rig, if you have an unexpected breakdown of an equipment, that means tens of millions of dollars. And then take it back to my world. I build machine learning algorithms that are going to say that there's something wrong with the equipment. I'm essentially adding another alarm to the mix. I'm creating more work for Bjorn in his opinion, that he has to check and check something else in addition to these hundreds of alarms. So when I first met Bjorn, uh, the, it was under the premise to uh, predict failures for the compressor of the Nodona platform. Those of you who aren't familiar with the oil and gas industry, a compressor is a mechanical device. And it's used to pressurize gas on platforms by minimizing the volume. So when I met Bjorn, we sat down in a room. We discussed what his role was, what his expectations for the application were, and what he wanted us to, to get out of the project. It became really obvious when we were having this conversation that there was a gap between us because of the two very different worlds that we come from. The first challenge was around aligning our expectations. Bjorn asked me if I could build a model that would tell him when the compressor was going to fail, why it was going to fail, and what type of rectifying actions he had to do to fix it. He essentially wants a self-driving compressor. But let me put that into context for you. A compressor has a normal lifetime of maybe 20 years. And in that 20-year lifespan, it will fail three times, maybe four times. So you're looking at one failure every five years to learn from. And each of those failures look completely different. 
So it's really hard to build an algorithm that's going to say with sufficient confidence that this type of failure mode is about to happen. The second challenge is something that you're probably all familiar with. Which model do I use? So in my world, I'm building these algorithms that, that are uh, describing complex equipment with very complex physical underlying behavior. So I have to choose a model that is sufficiently transparent so that I can communicate to the engineer why it's making those decisions so that he trusts it. I can choose to go the supervised learning route and run the risk that if the compressor fails and it looks different from the previous fingerprints of failure, that it won't raise an alarm. Or I can take an unsupervised approach, such as anomaly detection, using clustering, and take the time to understand what each of those clusters means. The third challenge comes around how we share our results. I talked about this gap between Bjorn and I, but that gap isn't only metaphorical. It's also physical. I sit in Oslo, and Bjorn sits in Stavanger on the west coast of Norway. And sometimes he's actually out on the platform. So it's really hard for me to find face-to-face -face time with him so that we can actually debug the model, see if the results make sense, and so forth. So I could take the time every single time I need him to look at something to put together a PowerPoint or put it in an email and send it to him and compile all those visualizations. But that takes a lot of time. And it also is, I'm not guaranteed to get a response from him immediately. I've also tried to sit down with Bjorn and look at this Python notebook, and because that's the world that I'm comfortable working in. This is how I like to work. But I found that working in code in front of the subject matter experts has a sort of alienating effect. They quite literally don't speak the language. So if you're going to be able to run a successful data science project in the asset-heavy industries, you're going to have to answer these three questions. So the first one around how do we align our expectations and make sure that there are no disappointments. So the way that we did this is by taking the time to explain to Bjorn why we couldn't build this uh, self-driving compressor. He's a really smart guy. He's an engineer with 20 years of experience. So he understands statistics, and he understands that it's not reasonable to build this type of algorithm. So in the end, we agreed that an anomaly detection algorithm, so something saying, when the compressor behavior looks outside of normal, that that would be sufficient and give him actionable enough insight. And finally, around sharing our results. So now I'm going to show the model that we actually built um, for this project. So Arundo was one of the first companies to uh, work in containerization and deployment of models. Uh, so a lot of companies are working in that now, but I think that one of the differentiators between our product is, is that we have the ability to auto-render a user interface. So I can just work in my native Python language and just with, my brought, with the Composer app from Arundo, wrap that code and generate a web endpoint in as little as five minutes. So that means that when Bjorn is out sitting on the platform, all he has to do is go to the URL that I've given him, type in the parameters that we've agreed are part of the model, and get some visualization and insight immediately. So I talked about that we were going to build an anomaly detection algorithm. And we did do that. We used clustering. And so we used some output from the clustering. Uh, and we built what we call a so-called virtual sensor. And so this virtual sensor describes the health of the compressor. So when it's hovering around zero, that means the compressor health is normal. And when there are deviations, so you see there in that big spike, that's because the sensors are behaving abnormally in that period. And you can see underneath that we've also got the single sensors and bring them up so that Bjorn can see which are the sensors that are causing the deviation. And this is important because there are hundreds of sensors that sit on a compressor. In this particular model, we use 100 sensors that go in. And so those sensors de describe lots of systems on the compressor. This is a huge piece of equipment. So the ability for him to drill down and see what's causing the anomaly is a huge, uh, has a huge impact for his time. We also just thought about what, in, what happens in the event that Bjorn is sick or it's somebody else that's monitoring the compressor. What if they don't know 
this compressor? What if they're not intimately familiar with the equipment and they don't know how these sensors behaved prior to historical failures? So what we also added was a tab where you could visualize those same anomalous sensors and their historical behavior. So that way they can see what, how did it behave the last time that we had a thrust bearing failure, for example. And finally, we tried to relate it back to the world of the end user. So this is a very complicated diagram. It's called a process and instrumentation diagram. Um, they are difficult for me to understand, but this is what Bjorn understands. If he's going to understand why are these five sensors of the 100 sensors on the compressor deviating, this is a helpful indication, because he can understand along which process lines they lie. So in the end, we were able to bridge the gap, and we were able to do that by aligning our expectations and building a model that had real actionable insight. Uh, so I hope that this is useful. Thank you so much for having me.